Greetings, everybody. Peter Maravellis here. Welcome to City Lights Live, our virtual reading series that follows in the footsteps of our insert calendar during the time of the pandemic. We continue to support the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums moving into the summer months. As always, we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. We would like to take this moment in acknowledgement and show our respect to those who have served as the stewards of the land. Tonight, we are delighted to have back in the house Carrie Perloff celebrating her new book, Pinter and Stoppard, A Director's View, published by Methune Drama Books. It's an imprint of Bloomsbury Books. Ms. Perloff is no stranger to City Lights as we've published her book, Beautiful Chaos, A Life in the Theater, which was awarded a One City, One Book Award. So we're really very, very thrilled to have her back in our orbit, albeit even virtual, but hey. Um, so this book is a, just a fascinating study. Ms. Perloff draws lines of connection between two of the leading British playwrights of our time. I mean, seemingly different in their aesthetics and their cultural and political views, yet as she points out, I mean, the two have so much in common. She draws upon her firsthand experience of working with both writers and creates a case study of particular plays and production to really provide kind of new ways of positioning both Pinter and Stoppard's work in contemporary culture. So Ms. Perloff is former artistic director of the American Conservatory Theater here in San Francisco, which she led from 1992 through to 2018. She has staged over 100 productions of classical and contemporary plays, including 11 by Tom Stoppard and two were American premieres, six by Harold Pinter and two of those were American premieres. Prior to ACT, Ms. Perloff ran New York's classic stage company from 1986 to 1992. Uh, she has directed at theaters across the country uh, as a playwright. Ms. Perloff's work has been widely produced. She has also contributed essays for numerous collections on theater, including Pinter at 60, directing Beckett, and the Pinter Review. So tonight, she's going to be joined in conversation by the Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, screenwriter, columnist, short story writer, great Bay Area literary treasure, Michael Shaben. He is the author of the novels The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, The Yiddish Policeman's Union, Telegraph Avenue, and Moonglow, amongst others. Before we begin, I would like to let you know we're going to be posting links in the chat function of our Zoom dashboard with which you may purchase copies of Pinter and Stoppard and also books by Mr. Shabin. Uh, also be featuring a Q&A at the end of the evening, so please post any questions, comments, and praise in that same chat function. So such a delight to have you both with us tonight on City Lights Live. Welcome to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Peter. It's oh, Peter, that was efficient. Amazing. <laughs> Hi, Michael. We'll see you later. Hi, Carrie. It's so Hi. good to see your face. You know, it's, I, I keep having this experience, having been shut in in various ways, you know, actually for a long time and then the virtual ways. Um, but I keep having this experience seeing certain people's faces again that I haven't seen in a long time and I know. a very joyful experience. And that's how I'm <laughs> feeling looking at you tonight. It's a great Yay. Day. Thank you. Um, I apologize for the barking dogs that are happening in the background. Um, so, uh, you know, your this project seems in some ways, although its roots go very far back into the beginnings of your career, um, you know, working in New York, um, it seems, and the book begins with the pandemic, in the pandemic, yeah, with your, your, um, the feel, the feeling that you had as it was all descending on us, as the lockdown was descending on us. Um, do you want to just talk a little bit about how that, what it was that sort of connected the pandemic to Pinter for you and then? <laughs> well, I, I had come home from a production um, at Arena Stage in Washington the day before the lockdown. And we got here and then it was something like March, what was it, 15th or something like that, mm -hmm. 2020. And what was so weird being in San Francisco is, it, it looked like nothing had changed. You know, the weather was beautiful. People were riding bikes by my window. I live right by Golden Gate Park. 
but this inchoate dread had filled uh, my consciousness in that way that you have in a pinter play, which is that something is off and peculiar and creepy and strange, but you can't see it. Because remember, at the beginning of the pandemic, we sort of didn't know, do you wash your mail? Is it somebody who comes to your door? Like, mm -hmm. what is this mm -hmm. thing? Mm -hmm. We didn't even know you wore masks. You looked at people and thought, are you infected? Are you infected? So I said, and I write, it's the first part of the book that this strange dread came over me. And as often happens at odd times in my life, when things change, I pull Pinter off the shelf. I find he's a good touchstone for almost anything. And that night, my husband and I started reading The Homecoming Out Loud, which is our most favorite play. Mm -hmm. And we would scream and laugh. He's British, you know, and he loves his stuff. And um mm -hmm. And so it really felt consonant with what this moment was. How do you articulate dread? Right. Yeah. This invisible menace that is, yeah. is you know, it's there, but you can't see it or point right. to it. Mm -hmm. That's Pinter. And did, did, had you already contemplated doing this book or make this, which, you know, in many ways, it, I didn't really quite know what I was in for when I started to read it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what what it is, it, it's like I feel that if you you know if 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 God forbid civilization were wiped out and and you, and only this book survived, you could figure out a way to revive twentieth century theater at least. Or wow, like, and a, it's in many ways it's sort of a it's a it's a personal and yet eminently practical guide to. <laughs> plunging into I would imagine the work of any playwright it, not just mm. not specifically Stoppard or, or Pinter mm. um it, you know it, it is a certain to a certain degree sort of a how-to or if not a how-to uh, here's how I did it here's how yeah. I approach both these specific authors authors but then sort of presumably any play that I'm is put in front of me yeah it's the work that I do had you so is that was that part of your intention or you, were you thinking of like you know, directors to come I mean I without um, I have always been frustrated that so little has been written about Stoppard and Pinter that I found useful in the rehearsal room. So there's tons, you know, I started studying Pinter with Martin Neslin a million years ago at Stanford and I read Theater of the Absurd. That's how I sort of got into it. Um, there's a wonderful critic called Austin Quigley who writes on uh, Pinter particularly who helped me enormously, but there's very little, like I, it's all very theoretical and very existential and it talks about it all in very abstract terms. And then you have to actually go in the room and do the plays. And so if you're working on Pinter and somebody tells you it's all symbolic or it's, you know, whatever, that doesn't help you make any choices in the room. Mm, right. And the same thing with Stoppard. And so I had thought long and hard as I was working on these plays, you know, I wish there was something I could have read that, sort of, that said, uh, this is what it is, but I, I didn't know how to write it. And one of the people that helped me a lot, I was talking to Colm Toybean, mm -hmm. whom I know you know, and he had written this book on Elizabeth Bishop. Yeah. Um, that was less a, an analysis of Elizabeth Bishop than, uh, than a study of a writer, but from the point of view of another writer. Right. And he said to me, just write a portrait of two artists from your point of view. <laughs> and that was incredibly liberating to me because I thought, oh, maybe I could do that. And that would justify this odd thing that is a bit odd about the book, which is that I put two writers together who truth be told are very different aesthetically, right? Very, very much so. I mean, it seems so unlikely as Peter alluded to in his introduction. Um, and yet you just like right out of the shoot, as soon as the introduction is over, you, <laughs> you just, you immediately take hold of that seeming incompatibility and build this really convincing case for all the surprising ways in which they Mm. Are, they have so much in common with each other. Well, in some ways, I, I, because, you know, when you write a book, first of all, you have to write a book proposal, so you have to justify it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you have to do in a book proposal, I mean, you don't have to do this because you're no, a famous I was going to say, novelist. you should try writing novels. So just... Yeah, but when you're not a famous novelist and you do a book proposal, they ask you questions like, what will the reader be able to do when he or she has finished this book? And you think, I don't know, build a shelf, direct a stop and play. Oh, yes. So, so I thought, okay, but what are the things, you know, how do you articulate um, the kind of thesis of the book? And what I realized is a few things, Michael. One is they're both 
incredible autodidacts. They stopped school at 17, which I found very moving. Two of the most learned, hungry, um, amazingly intellectually alive, curious people I'd ever worked with taught themselves everything they knew or learned what they knew in high school. You know, mm -hmm. so, so that interested me that they were both hungry. They were knowledge, uh, had appetite for, for useless knowledge, particularly as Stoppard would say. The second, which we'll talk about is that they're Jewish writers and they both lived through the trauma of the Second World War in very profound ways as children. I think that outsider status had a huge impact on the kind of writing. Um, they're both game players. You know, they were on the same cricket team, Stop right. and Ginger. So, and games feature very big in both of their plays. You know, Goldberg says in the birthday party, play up, play up and play the game. Mm -hmm. So that interested me. Um, and they both were sort of lovers of uh, the rehearsal process. So they were not theorists. They loved to be in the room. No question was too stupid. They laughed at their own jokes. They mm -hmm. really cared how their language came across. They revered actors. So in that way, I thought they had a lot in common. And, you know, I really felt my way uh, as I wrote this book, because I wasn't really sure what I was going to do or how I was going to shape it. And in the end, I thought, no, they sort of do sit next to each other. But they really do. And I mean, I kept having the experience reading this book of like, oh my God, totally, totally. They have that in common. They have this in common. Mm -hmm. I think you, you, you ferreted out a lot of things that had hitherto been have hitherto been in. Here's one thing too that I want to say for people watching who saw some of these plays at ACT. These are the writers of the nonprofit theater movement after the war. And I think that is incredibly important to say. Will you talk they about that? I thought that was fascinating. Well, they're the air. You know, I wrote a chapter in the book that was the context that they appeared in when they suddenly appeared on the scene in the in the 60s, because I thought at least American writers may not know this. But, you know, they came out of the tradition of Noel Coward, Terrence Radigan, J.B. Priestley, these kind of very brilliant comedic male uh, West End playwrights. But there hadn't been a nonprofit theater. You know, the RSC didn't exist in right, the National right. Theater. So they were the beginnings. And I don't think they would have had the career they had if they hadn't been um, uh, nurtured and taken care of by nonprofit theaters that could afford to do, you know, a 22 character Tom Stoppard play oh, or yeah. however many people is in Rosencrantz, you know, that was the national theater. And Sto and and Pinter, you know, was um, taken in by the Lyric Cameron Smith and then by, by the RSC. And I think, therefore, they could write risk-taking, unusual plays that were not commercial and find a home for them. Um, which so they were the, you know it was a confluence of history and, um, and you also, also you mentioned that, that those those theaters were also as the name would suggest like the royal shakespeare company yeah yeah they were stacking their work right up against that's right classic works of british theater as if that was okay or you know well normal. But it was, I mean, Pinter's background is he was an actor in a rep company in Ireland. So this is a man who could recite whole swaths of Shakespeare or Webster, Duchess of Malfi, he loved by heart because he performed all the plays. And I think people forget when they think he's so avant-garde and strange and mysterious that he knew how to write a curtain line and how to work a sound cue in mm -hmm. because he did Agatha Christie. He'd done all those murder mysteries, you know? So I have a whole chapter in the book about, I think Pinter writes magic tricks uh, uh, just like he learned to do on stage. So I have a whole chapter about props in Pinter, right. how you make a prop, how they detonate, what a sound cue is. And he learned all that, you know, from being on stage, from being an actor. In right, I mean, it's really powerful that the, the prop that you talk about at some length is the, um, the drum in the birthday party, which, you know, I, me I remember the first time I saw that play and, and it's so terrible. Yeah. And yet it's just a toy drum, right? It's, and, right. and, um, uh, will you talk a little bit about just your your relationship to the drum as a prop? Was a practical matter, and will you talk a little bit about the tr how hard it can be sometimes? Yeah. I mean, the birthday party is the play I worked on with Pinter in the room right. um, in New York at the Classic Stage Company when I was very young. And we were doing it on a double bill with um, the American premiere of Mountain Language. And um, and what was amazing about him being in the room, and this had to do with the props too, is that he watched the plays, he wrote those magic tricks, but he watched the plays as if somebody else had written it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like he wasn't sure how the trick was gonna go. <laughs> and, and he didn't say to you, I'll tell you how to do this. Mm -hmm. He just wanted to see what you would do with it. So if you 
the drum in the birthday party is this savage, terrifying thing that happens at the end of Act One, but it's the sweetest thing as well because Meg, who adores Stanley so much, she knows he's unhappy. She he was a concert pianist. She says it's his birthday, so she gives him a present, mm -hmm. and he opens it and he says, "It's a drum." <laughs> a boy's drum and she looks at him and says it's because you haven't got a piano <laughs> I mean, it's just so heartbreaking right so he says shall i put it round my neck as if it's a noose and she says yes there's some sticks in there she says and then he starts to play it and of course he loses his mind and it's very frightening so the actor has to bang hard enough on the drum to lose his mind but if you just buy a toy drum the head will break and then what happens it's an act two you have to have the real drum and then you do have to substitute the head for a paper head right. because in act two in the interrogation in the party scene when they play blindman's buff mccann has to put his foot through it and ruin it and so it's a very tricky prop to make and you have to have a double and you have to put paper on in the middle mm -hmm. do you know it's like the glasses that stanley wears have to snap in act two and it was david strathairn who figured out if you actually sawed a hole if you cut the glasses in half sawed a hole and put a toothpick in then it would snap and make the right noise and pinter thought this was fantastic <laughs> you know? i mean he loved diy solutions mm -hmm. And that but is like magic. Say to you, oh, we did it like this. He <laughs> absolutely let you discover it, yeah. which I always found very generous and very funny. You know that he didn't prescribe. Well, having had the the, the incredible good fortune to work with both of them so intimately, so directly, um, you know, was, was your first. When did you first start to see some kind of overlap between these two writers and their work? Was it that sort of cooperative? Um, I mean, they both, yeah, they both loved, loved, loved being in the room. And I will say, because my publisher told me I was being very Pollyanna-ish in saying that they were such um, nice men and, wow. and that they must have been patronizing to me. I, I had, <laughs> I will not name them here, but I've had terrible experiences in the American theater with the great men who have treated me like the maid. But neither Pinter nor Stoppard mm -hmm. was ever anything other than unfailingly generous and collaborative. And I think it's because... They understood that a rehearsal room is run by a director. And if you undercut the director, you'll never get a product that is that you're proud of. And so mm -hmm. they never interfered unless I asked. And then they would say something. They're very different in the room because Pinter was a great director and a great actor. Mm -hmm. So he knew like you could stand with your back to the audience and scare them to death because he'd done that as Iago, you know. Um, uh, so he loved things like that. And he loved watching actors go at it physically and things like that. He also knew something which sounds very peculiar, but which is it's better not to walk and talk at the same time in a mm. pinter play mm. because, because language is action. And so moving while you're talking muddies the action and you oh. might as well do one or the other and trust it. Stoppard is very different because he's not an actor nor a director but he is meticulous about what he calls the sound of his plays. You know, he loves the music of it and he knows how he thinks it should sound. Not that he's prescriptive, but he always kind of wants to give a line reading and then he's careful not to. Mm -hmm. um, what Stoppard, he's very different in this way. He writes, you know, maximalist plays, Pinter writes minimal plays. So Pinters are all in a room, very spare, you know, in some kind of abstract interior. Uh, Stoppards are set on, you know, a, an estate, uh, you know, a Byronic estate in the 19th century like Arcadia, or they are set in Prague during the, you know, uh, uh, you know, Soviet occupation, right. or they're set jumpers with a bunch of acrobats on, you know. Right, and multiple time periods. Multiple time periods, invention of love, travels back and forth between the present and the past about A.E. Houseman, mm -hmm. travesties is three artists in a room in, in, in a library in Zurich. So, so Stoppard loves designers and he loves watching designers solve problems. And he loves setting up a problem that a designer has to solve. And that's why I think artists love to do his plays because they're not prescriptive. Uh, they are kind of templates. He always said his plays are just blueprints for production that they don't really exist till you put them on their feet. So you have to solve all those things. Mm -hmm. You know, like Ruth disappearing behind a couch in night and day and coming mm -hmm. up naked. You gotta <laughs> solve it. It's like, how do you do that, Tom? And you'd say, Oh, Carrie, you'll figure it out. You know, 
Um, so, you know, they were fun in the room because they liked to see what you were going to come up with and they never wanted it to look like the production they knew. Like, I'll give you an example with Pinter. We did the birthday party in a thrust theater, not in a proscenium. And he was really used to his plays all being done in a proscenium with the curtain. So in the birthday party, the scary things happen upstairs, right. you know, where Goldberg takes Lulu. And we had to put a real staircase because it was on three sides. The actors had to exit. And he was fascinated by that pinter because that isn't how he'd ever envisioned it. Mm -hmm. Because the it was rake, supposed to be. the rake stage. Mm -hmm. And so one day he said to Peter Rieger, Peter, I wonder if you might do me a favor. And Peter's like, okay, Harold. <laughs> Would you add a line for me? And he's thinking, oh my God, what is he going to say? And he said, when you get halfway up the stairs, would you turn and look at Meg and say to her, what a lovely flight of stairs, <laughs> which was very unusual for Pinter, who never changed a word or a pause, as opposed to Stoppard. Unlike Stoppard, right? Really, to he, rewrite. There are, there are, there are, there seemingly are multiple drafts of some of Stoppard's plays that are right. out there floating around being produced with different lines of dialogue and yeah. Yeah, he kind of thinks you can make it bespoke and he's not sacred about it, even mm -hmm. if it's published one way. I'm sure it drives his publisher insane, but he feels, you know, uh, if you need a different thing or you have a different actor or the double is different or the comedy isn't landing, do this or do that. And he, like we rewrote, he rewrote the whole end of Indian Ink completely the second time we did it and we did it in 98 when it was first done mm -hmm. uh, we did the american premiere and then we did it 20 years later in new york and then at act and he rewrote the whole ending because he didn't think it worked and how much in both with both of them uh, how much work did you do or felt like you had to do to um adapt or accommodate a, a you know very intrinsically english work for an American audience, and and how were what were their respective yeah. attitudes toward the need or the or the necessity or the or the or the lack thereof? Yeah, I mean, when we did Mountain Language, he thought about changing some of the language of just specific words, Pinter, like Baby Sham or John Dokes. We would say, no, Joseph Dokes. They say in England when we'd or say John, John Doe. Doe, you mm -hmm. know. In the end, we didn't change a word because the rhythms of Pinter's language are so precise, there's no point screwing with them in order to make it easier. Does that worry you a little as the director for in your directing for an American audience? Like, okay, I, I see your point, but that, you that know, sort of robbed of, the line of- I mean, I think because I've done so many classical plays, you know, one of the things you accept, I mean, language is everything. This is why I fundamentally don't believe in updating Shakespeare. And I think it's absolutely fine if you listen to a Shakespeare play and you get 60, 70% of it. Mm -hmm. Most groundlings watching Shakespeare in you know, 1598 would only have gotten 60% too, that's all right. In your novels, probably, there are many, many things that people don't really get. That's part of the pleasure wow. of it, do you know? <laughs> and, and so, um, and I think, you know, that, that Stoppard would say that too, his plays are very dense, filled with illusions. When we did Rock and Roll, which you saw at ACT, I remember, Michael, if you didn't know who Dubček and Husek and you didn't know a lot about Czech politics, there were a lot of things that were going to go right by you. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Stoppard, he'd worry about it if it weren't emotionally clear. Uh -huh. so I have a whole lot of stuff in the book about like in when we did rock and roll, there was a scene we could not make sense of emotionally. We could not figure out how to play it. And he sent me a 15 page fax mm -hmm. handwritten, mm -hmm. which I re reproduced some of in the book, trying to explain to me it was so moving moment to moment to moment to moment what he thought the emotional logic of the scene was that mattered to him that it was not opaque emotionally if it was unclear because a word is not a word we would use or you know that in the hard problem they called it guy fox night and we would call it bonfire night that's okay <laughs> he figured eventually you know the audience would kind of get the emotional gist of it um you know he did take things out when we did indian ink he took out a lot of references to madame blavatsky or things he really thought nobody in america would mm -hmm. get but also i have to tell you the joy of doing these plays, you know, Stoppard's plays, particularly at ACT, is it's such a brilliant audience. You know, we published these things called Words on Plays before every 
uh, play and audiences would sit and tear it in half before dinner and each read half of it before, <laughs> before it was digital. Mm -hmm. So the audiences, you know, um, we didn't have to cut the plays. They seemed to be willing to go there. And, um, you know, I think ultimately emotionally or in Pinter's case, erotically, you know, Pinter is all about power and sex. Mm -hmm. And if you can get that, then if you miss all the references, that's okay. Yeah, you're okay. Well, it was interesting too there, in, among their differences that emerged throughout, as, as I, I was reading the book, one of the starkest differences seemed to be in each writer's approach to his characters in <laughs> terms of what one, what, for example, what the actor playing that character needs to know about the character before the play ever started. Yeah. The backstory, we would call it. Um, and I was really, it was hard for me to accept as a writer who like spends a lot of time coming up with biographies for my characters mm -hmm. and, and things that I know perfectly well may never ever appear anywhere in the book, but help me sort of figure out a character. Pinter seemed to view all that as, as he was allergic to anything like that. He, he, this is a great quote. One of my favorite things that helped me direct Pinter, he wrote, apart from any other consideration, we are faced with the immense difficulty, if not the impossibility of verifying the past. I don't mean merely years ago, but yesterday, this morning, what took place? What was the nature of what took place? What happened? If one can speak of the difficulty of knowing what in fact took place yesterday, one can, I think, treat the present in the same way. What's happening now? Yeah. So, you know, with Pinter, it it's always like he, because he had the most acute sense of observation of any playwright I've ever worked with. It's like he was listening to people talk on a bus and he would create distilled stage poetry out of what he heard. Mm -hmm. And out of what he heard, he would then begin as a writer to deduce what it was they were talking about and why. He never presumed to know more about their biography than they were willing to reveal themselves. Okay. So if you asked him something like, in the birthday party, Stanley, Stanley Weber, is Stanley Jewish? He would think about it for a long time and he'd say, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you'd ask him a question like, um, why does Meg keep asking Petey to read her the newspaper? What is the problem with this marriage? What can you tell us, Harold? And he'd pause and then he'd say, I believe she's forgotten how to read. You know, he'd say <laughs> things like that. So he'd give you a note you could play, but he never presumed to know the details about somebody's past any more than you would know, than I'd know your past or you'd know mine. You know, he, he was very respectful of his characters and what they were willing to reveal. I think with Stoppard, Stoppard is a very shy man for somebody who's so beautiful and brilliant. He's actually quite emotionally, he once said he was culpably self-sufficient. So he's quite hesitant to reveal himself. Mm -hmm. And he's quite, his characters do not confess things. Mm -hmm. So he will somewhere in his plays plant a kind of outburst where suddenly you find out who somebody really is, but that can be halfway through the play. So mm -hmm. he does not do what American playwrights tend to do, which is set up a series of hooks that will take you to the revelation about the character. Instead, you'll be going along in one direction and suddenly there'll be a reversal and you'll think, oh, that's the truth of what it is. Mm -hmm. And he waits for that reversal. And he's quite, um, he wants to be sure you don't tip your hand too soon. You know, it's you when yeah. you're talking about the outburst moment, it made me think of um, what I've read, what I read in your book or what I've read elsewhere about Leopold Stotwitz. I, I guess very few of us have seen it, right? Because it mm. was, it was, it had, had it already, it had opened, but- it opened right before the pandemic. And then I just saw it in October, it and came now, back, yeah. And, and that sound, it sounds as if the outburst in that play is not until the very oh, end of the play, right? Michael. Well, that's the most amazing thing. You know, we can talk about this if you want the, there's a whole chapter in the book on the Jewish question with yeah, both yeah, writers. Yes, but, I was hoping we could. And Stoppard's past, it, this little moment is so amazing. You know, he was a two-year-old in Zlin, Czechoslovakia, when he was his family was forced to flee, and he they end up in Singapore, and his father uh, volunteers and gets his ship is blown up by a Japanese gunboat, and his he and his brother and his mother are on a ship going to Australia to find safety when they get rerouted to India, and he grows up in India during the war. 
um, and he knows nothing about, he doesn't realize his father is dead for years and uh, has no relationship really to his father at all. And then this odd thing happens. He goes many years later when he's 60 something to Prague um, and he meets a, a woman who um, tells him that um, she as a child had walked through a glass door and Stoppard's father, um, had, who had been the surgeon at the Bato shoe factory had stitched up her wrist and he said he touched this woman's wrist. And in that moment, all the grief of his past sort of caught up to him and he realized what he'd lost. And I thought that was so heartbreaking. So at the end of Leopoldstadt, there is a character who is sort of Stoppard, you know, who turns up in Vienna as this very feckless kind of, it's scary that he writes about himself this mm -hmm. way because it takes courage to write about yourself as very somebody. Uncharitable. So, Uncharitable. You know, the guy is really kind of um, ignorant. He loves being a British kid. Mm -hmm. He's in his 20s. He sort of says, oh, I'm sorry, you had a bad war. And she says, what are you talking <laughs> about a bad war? Mm -hmm. Don't you realize who you are and what happened to your family? And, and how can you, and she says, you walk through life as if you cast no shadow, which I think is a beautiful image, but everybody has a shadow. And that's when, um, it comes to him, he realizes um, this thing about the scar. He realizes what that scar is and what his memory is of his, mm -hmm. of his childhood and the Nazis. So I think for Stoppard, these things, these touchstones, he calls them the lacrimae rerum, you know, the tears of things. And, mm -hmm. and, and he, he's, he's really an archeologist, you know, who's, I mean, this is one of the reasons I realized I loved him so much and that he was a very Jewish writer, even when he didn't know it, he's obsessed as you are in your books in a way, I think very beautifully with lost culture, mm -hmm. you know, with, um, uh, with the things that remain, these few tokens that remain of a culture that are so random, you know, that when Thomasina says to oh, Septimus yeah. and Arcadia, yeah. oh, yeah. Septimus, how can you bear it? All the lost plays of Aeschylus and Sophocles, mm -hmm. you know, and how, you know, you have that sense that Stoppard realized about the burning of the books and the culture that's been lost, mm -hmm. all of Central European culture, and how he longed in a way to reclaim that. I don't know that he would have known it consciously, but I think that's very much. In it's his very work. mysterious because it is such a rich part of his work and it's as if he did know but it seems like he, I mean, if he had any idea whatsoever, it really does seem like the faintest sense. And it was, and his mother does seem to have worked very hard to keep it from him. Totally. Um, so yeah. it was just somehow never, I mean, in a way like that invisible Pintarian, you know, gas that you're talking yeah. about, like that miasma that's there, you can feel it, but you don't, you can't see it and you don't know what right. it is. Um, yeah. You know, it was part of him. So when you, when you found out, when you heard that when he first wrote about, I think it was in Talk Magazine, right? When he first wrote about his his discovery um, of the truth of his heritage, did you have a feeling like you talk in the book? You talk about I think it was your maybe your maternal grandmother, and who was herself uh, a, a refugee had come. My mother. Oh, it was your mother who had that sort of has the sort of the Jewish equivalent of Gadar. Um, it would sort yes, of yes. always be able to like suss people out and oh yes and wonder what their name had been before they changed. Oh, it. that was her father. Yeah, oh, my that, grandfather. Okay. My grandfather always knew mm -hmm. when somebody had changed their name mm -hmm. and was hiding. So it did you have hilarious. a sense like that of, of Tom when you when, well, when you it, heard the news? You. You're like, oh, I knew it. Or I mean, or, you know, when it's somebody who feels like family to you. When I when Harold Pinter walked into my theater when I was 25 years old in New York, you know. I thought, oh my God, I know you, you know, and the name changing thing was hilarious, Michael, because he could sniff it too. And we had an actress playing Lulu called Wendy McKenna. And he kept looking at her going, McKenna, McKenna, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm not buying Scottish. It. And yeah. she'd say, no. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, um, McKenna, McKenna, um, Irish? No. And then he realized, no, ultimately her name was Wendy Rosenberg. And she, she was a nice Jewish girl who changed her name. And he thought that was hilarious and she thought it was hilarious that he recognized that and in his plays naming is always very dangerous very complicated and characters change their name all the time mm -hmm. with Stoppard you know I first met him at the National Theatre in London at the bar and he walked in and you know he sounds and feels completely Central European mm -hmm. and I think 
even more than the Jewish thing, it's sort of Central European culture that I was brought up on. My mother's a Viennese refugee, left Vienna in 1938, is, uh, you know, grew up in this very cultured family that revered language and art. And so he felt completely familiar to me. All the things he valued mm -hmm. and cared about and loved and treasured um, were the things my family cared about and valued and loved and treasured. So um, as opposed to, you know, although I'm married to a Brit and I've known my husband since I was at Oxford when I was 21, I, I never wanted to direct waspy English playwrights. I never did David Hare or David Edgar. Or those playwrights I never felt I had anything in common with. Um, so the thing about Stoppard and Pinter is they were both outsiders. You know, they're not that many Jewish playwrights of that period. And um, I think they viewed the world slightly from the outside. And I think that is part of what makes them such kind of unusual and remarkable writers. They aren't like anyone else, you know, their language, their point of view, their sense of the world. You know, with Pinter, the knock on the door, he always said he knew the Gestapo was coming. This was not abstract to him. There was huge anti-Semitism in England after the war. Yeah. He was very aware of that, of what that felt like, you know, to be he stuck. He got into some scraps, way. right? He was, he, he got into yeah. fights. Yeah, he learned how to fight verbally. So that's partly why his language is like that. And all the comedy in the birthday party, you know, and in the homecoming is all Jewish comedy. Like if you don't do the plays Jewish, I have this thing in the book that I know people here are not going to like, but I compare Pinter to Arthur Miller and I am not an Arthur Miller fan and I've never wanted to do Arthur Miller because to me, these are Jewish plays in hiding. Mm -hmm. They are pseudo universal. You know that in Death of a Salesman is a Jewish family posing as some universal family where the if kids and call, happy. If and happy, <laughs> give me a ridiculous. break. Yeah. But you know it's a Jewish family, and I think the homecoming, which is Pinter's equivalent of Salesman, is a greater play because, in some way, it's more authentic. You know, mm -hmm. it's sort of more honest. You talk so. about this thing I'd never heard of. It's incredible the 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 Yiddish production of Death of a Salesman, the Yiddish language. That, That's you know, right. Not long after the the original, that that was viewed at least by some people as having like that's how it. Was meant that's to right. be. In some people way. finally said, "Oh, that's who Arthur Miller was. His <laughs> uncle was a Yiddish salesman." Yes, that's mm -hmm. true. So I thought that was so interesting, and and um, you know, obviously, as I say, more palpable in Pinter because the language is Jewish and the characters. His father was a y Jewish tailor, so mm -hmm. Goldberg is a tailor and says to Meg, "Turn around, walk down the aisle." I used to be in the business, you know. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And as I say, with Stoppard, it's a bit more subliminal, but I think, you know, there's a kind of sorrow in a way. And there's also, I'll read you one other thing I always was so moved by. When I read Hermione Lee's beautiful uh, biography, which you all should look at, she right. talks about this sort of strange disconnect, how he never knew about his, his own father, how he died. And I suddenly realized in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, Michael, there is this line where Guildenstern says to the player King, he stabbed himself and he's fallen to the ground. And he says, Guildenstern says, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. You can't act death. The fact of it has nothing to do with seeing it happen. It's not gasps and blood and falling about. That isn't what makes it death. It's just a man failing to reappear. That's all. Now you see him, now you don't. That's the only thing that's real. Here one minute, gone the next, and never coming back, an exit, unobtrusive and unannounced. And I thought, you know, that's his father. That's what happened to him. That absolutely. So he all his plays are about this kind of divided self, right? Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, or Hapgood is the double in Hapgood, or Houseman and Young Houseman. He always has that bifurcated self, and I think, you know, that's his childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so amazing. The uh, when you talk about um, your, you mentioned just now your first meeting with Pinter, and when he, you were, when you were doing the uh, the uh, mountain language, language. and um, you know how you had this the same feeling I think anyone who knew anything or thinks they knew anything about Pinter would have in this situation of like this is terrifying <laughs> he has a fearsome reputation he has a reputation for being difficult people had told you that people warned you when they heard that you were going to be doing it. like you'd been scared you've been warned and he comes in and not only is he not like that but and he's collaborative and all these things but you make this horrible mistake, Carrie, of having a baby 
Oh, yeah. before, right? Like I like, did. Like I can only imagine what you like. If you hear someone, <laughs> especially a man in particular, is scary and is intimidating, you sort of immediately leap to the conclusion he probably doesn't love babies that much. Yeah, or, yeah. or having one in a theater anyway, while while a play is being rehearsed. Right. It sounds like a recipe for catastrophe. And not only was it not the case, but you tell this <laughs> great story about how it actually how he worked it. He used your yeah. baby as a as a sort of a it. dramaturgical I mean, his, tool. His agent was very unhappy because we were remounting the birthday party, which we had done successfully the year before with this new production of Mountain Language. And then I was pregnant and she kept right ringing me saying, have you had that child yet? And I kept saying, don't worry about it, Judy. It's all going to be fine. And then Lexi, my daughter, was was quite late and she was born 10 days before we had to start rehearsal. And I was told that he didn't like children. So I hid her in the dressing room at CSC. And she has always been to this day. She's an incredible sleeper. So she would sleep in her little carry cot. And then Jean Stapleton, who was playing Meg in the birthday party, would come to me and say, whisper, the princess needs you now. And then I would know it was time to take a break. And I would nurse her. And Peter Rieger would say, well, Kay, we always knew what act Carrie was on by which breast the baby was on. <laughs> so, and Pinter never even mentioned it. And then one day we were doing Mountain Language and Rieger was playing the prisoner who had never gotten to see his child. And he was very having really a hard time with it and um, felt I had miscast him and that he shouldn't be playing this vulnerable character and he didn't know how to do it. And suddenly Pinter stood up, left the room, went to the dressing room, picks up the carry cart with the baby, brings her in, she's fast asleep, puts her on the table. And he says very kindly and reasonably to Peter, but very practically, Peter, you're a political prisoner. You will never see your child for no through no fault of your own. This is the baby mm. that you will never see. And you are grieving the thought that you will never have a future in which this child is part of your life. That's all it is. Simple. Mm. Now play the scene. So Peter looks at the baby and he sort of starts to cry. Mm -hmm. And then he plays the scene with Jean and it's beautiful. And then nobody says anything. And then Pinter picks up the baby and takes her back to the dressing room. And it never, ever got mentioned, oh. except that in years later, Peter Rieger was very friendly with my daughter and Pinter would ask after her, you know. Oh, um, so that fantastic. was always, very funny. And I do say in the book, Michael, that, you know, you know, because your books are all punctuated by your children and raising mm -hmm. your children and how that worked, that, that these playwrights are woven into my life and, and my children. And yeah. my happiest last experience working with Stoppard at, at ACT is that my son, Nick, whose music moniker is wingtip did the music for the hard problem because Tom wanted him to. Wow, that's and so I kept weird. saying, this is a little nepotism Tom. <laughs> oh no, Carrie, it'll be marvelous. And I went into the theater one day and there was Stoppard and Nick with the headphones on my oh. Nick listening to music. And I thought that was, so that was great. a good closure. That's fantastic. Well, your book, you know, I'm like, I hope you can tell, I really loved it. I got so much out of it and I learned so much and I mean, I'm not going to be, next time I see either a Pinter or a Stoppard play, I'm going to look at it in a totally different way than I have before. Good. Um, I really recommend it. We have some questions um, in the chat, which um, let me just like turn to and see what we've got. Um, the magic trips. We have a magician, yes. a daughter of a magician. I was ambushed by the magic trips as a daughter of a magician. One of those young men in Tannen's back room and a writer, my eyes suddenly opened to the obvious how two art forms reflect each other near seamlessly. I mean, yeah, there is, there, there must be, I imagine, depends on the play, of course, um, but you give a lot, you gave some examples tonight and there's a lot others mm. in the book, but you must have to engage all the time in, in sort of stage magic of one kind or another. I mean, how the reason it's much more fun to do playwrights like these than hyper-realistic playwrights is that nothing is quite real. That's why it's fun, right? And they learn that from their own trade or Pinter learned it from being an actor with Donald Wolfett, who was this crazy, who kept every single prop from the plays he ever that. did. So Lear's whip was like a very particular thing. And of course, that's what makes theater fun is that the stuff isn't real. It's not real. Right. It's a thing that has to be um, detonated, you know? So there's this thing you have to do in the birthday party, which is that McCann, who's this Irish thug, tears newspaper into strips. Right. And it's so fucking, oh, excuse me, it's so <laughs> scary to watch, but you have no idea what it means. And it doesn't have to mean anything as, as you know, um, 
Joyce said, it isn't about the thing, it, or Beckett said about Joyce, it is not about the thing, it is the thing itself. Mm -hmm. It's just five strips of paper, why is it so scary? But the sound of newspaper ripping mm -hmm. is a really scary sound. And what we found when we did it at the Geary is the Geary's too big and you couldn't hear it. And our sound designer had to slide a mic through the sleeve of Marco Baricelli so that as the newspaper ripped, the sound got louder and louder as it went up his sleeve. And wow. nobody in the theater would have known that, but that's part of the magic trick, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I think Pinter you know, knew that those things that looked real are not real. And that's why theater is more fun than film or different from film. And there must be some some plays might call for effects that are standard and you know how to do them or the prop manager knows how to do them. But, yeah. but these are often calling for things that no one's ever had to do before in a play or at least. Right. Yeah. That, that's the thing, you know, it looks very cheap. Pinter looks cheap. It's a table, two chairs, whatever. And you think no big deal, but yeah. actually the stuff that it requires is quite uh, difficult. Stoppard sets himself a different problem, which is that every play of his, Stoppard likes to structure it as a game. So like the real thing, it has a scene that looks like a man and a woman breaking up. And then the next scene is actually a play within a play. And you realize that right. that's the real scene. Right. And the first right. scene is just right. the play. So he likes to keep the audience guessing and figure out if they know the rules of the game, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, he knows what they are. And I'm telling you how that man keeps structure in his mind is beyond me. Well, he so that's often it starts with misdirection, right? Like a lot of his plays, you don't, you think you're seeing something, it turns out that's not what you just saw. Totally. Yeah. yeah. He loves misdirection and he'll always wrong foot you. So you mm -hmm. think the play, like night and day, it starts and you hear this helicopter going overhead and you hear da 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 And you think, oh my God, the guy is lying outside uh, with a camera around his neck. He's about to get killed. And then he wakes up and he's been having a nightmare and the sound of the uh, machine gun is a typewriter. And, and he's a journalist and Tom loves journalism and reads many mm -hmm. papers a day. So he was curious about that. So, mm -hmm. you know, they have really big imaginations. And I think what I said at the end of the book that I so appreciated is they make your imagination bigger when you work with them because nothing's prescriptive and you have to, you have to keep uh, getting outside of yourself. And I think that's uh, the gift of great writing right. is it makes you bigger than you were. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question. Uh, do you think it's possible to produce jumpers today? I'm thinking about its striptease and other elements of British sex farce, not very PC. Well, I will say right up front, none of Stoppard and Pinter is PC. Um, and, and yet, I think they're great humanists with enormous um, breadth. So um, it's up to you how, you know, how you read them. I mean, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it is a kind of classic sex farce, but it's also really a play about philosophy, jumpers. Right. Um, I do think, and this is kind of parenthetical, but not parenthetical, they write wonderful women. I mean, it's one reason they're really fun to do. And again, I don't think this is true. Um, certainly it's not true of their parallel American writers. Like if you look at David Mamet, like mm -hmm. next to Pinter and Mamet reveres Pinter and sent him all the plays. Um, the, the women in David Mamet are never characters you would want to spend more than five minutes with. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I think, you know, Pinter and Stoppard write fantastic female characters. So I don't think Jumpers is just a denigration of, or is a denigration of women at all. Mm -hmm. Stoppard loves sex, period. The men are sexy too. He likes talking about sex and thinking about sex. He has jokes in Arcadia about date rape, but it's really about the date of a Byron poem. So right. you can't be too easily offended. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think you know, this woke moment that we're living through may not be the perfect moment for Stoppard and Pinter unless you get their irony, but that's sort of part of the, you know, kind of pleasure. And I will say this one thing, Michael, because I was very sad when I finished writing the book, I sort of thought, you know, maybe this isn't a moment that these two writers are going to be produced and maybe mm. they'll disappear. And, mm. and then I was watching this beautiful interview with an Indian director whose work I really admire called Abishar Mujamdek. Um, uh, about how he, as a theater artist, had survived COVID in India, which was so awful. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I survived by reading Tom Stoppard's The Coast of Utopia. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, Belinsky, who's the literary critic there, his comments on humanism and the hope of the imagination, that's what kept me going. And I thought, well, if in the middle of COVID in India, you know, Stoppard could speak to that artist, then it's bigger than we think. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, and, and a play like, first, I mean, Pinter's work, especially those earlier plays, feel so prescient in so many ways. That right? their, their prescience was apparent, you know, shortly after they were first produced and has kind of sadly never diminished. Um, yeah. It's hard to imagine a world without, you know, the room and the birthday party and, uh, you know. And particularly, uh, I, you know, Michael, I tell another story in the book about doing celebration in the room right after 9-11. Um, which was one of the most profound experiences I ever had in the theater because we thought, should we even be doing theater right after 9-11? Wow. And, and The Room is a play about terror. And people had always thought it was abstract and much has been written about it. It's this woman, you know, Rose, who's in her kitchen with her big husband, Bert, who never speaks and is so scary. And as soon as he leaves, there's a knock on the door and these faceless people are outside. Well, after 9-11, the knock on the door, you know, Americans knew suddenly what terror felt like and the play felt incredibly immediate right. and i realized that one person's abstract play is another person's realism which always reminded me of what jan Kott said about brecht and beckett when he said in poland this was during the cold war when we want fantasy we do brecht and when we want realism we do beckett and i've always thought about that i thought it's such a great quote and i think uh -huh. it's true that you know Pinter never thought his plays were abstract. He thought that was real life. That was his version of realism. And I think that has caught up to us. Mm -hmm. You know, the sexual politics, all of it, mm -hmm. um, uh, in a way, is feels very immediate. And I think with Stoppard, the thing that's most immediate is how we've come to learn about fake news and about language, mm -hmm. that the dangers of language that is cliched political speak. Um, the horrors of what we listen to every day, um, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, like when we listen to Putin calling this invasion of Ukraine, um, uh, what does he call it? Denazification. Uh, the denazification and the something intervention, the necessary intervention, mm -hmm. and it's literally a genocide. So Stoppard is brilliant, at, and so is Pinter, at defamiliarizing language so that the thing you think you know, you know, you think you know what the word means, it's suddenly subverted and it becomes something else. Right. Um, because I think they thought their goal, you know, there's a great line in No Man's Land when Hearst says to Spooner, the all we have left is the English language. Can it be salvaged? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what they were trying to do, salvage the English language. Well, you talked too about, you mentioned earlier the, the, the heartbreaking speech um, um, about the, all the classic works, the Greek classics from, from um, Arcadia. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, for, and you talked about loss too and stop art and loss. Like in this, we're living through a moment where it feels like so much is being lost and yeah. or is in danger, imminent danger of being lost from, you know, a woman's right to decide what to do with her body to yeah. the, 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 the natural environment all around us. Um, yeah. And that, that place, it ought to be eternal. So, you know, if, if for no other reason, it's such a beautiful, wonderful play for the, its evocation of that loss. Mm. And then, and for that, well, I don't, I don't, I can't quote lines from plays, but the follow up, the what 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 Septimus says to her and responds yeah. to her invoking all of the lost plays, all the things That's humanity right. has lost. And he away. says he says something like, you know, we we travel as we live, and much is lost on them, and we hold things in our arms, and much is lost along the way. You drop but them. Things will be found again, mm -hmm. you know, in generations to come. And I always have to reassure myself about that because we're also in a period right now of incredible hostility to the past. Mm -hmm. So we don't we don't read history. We're not really interested in history unless we pretend that our constitution is sacrosanct. Then we pretend to read it. Right. And certainly about classical literature, you know, we don't we're not interested in that anymore. We don't do Chekhov and Ibsen and Lorca and Brecht and Shakespeare mm -hmm. anymore. And so I'm very sad. That that things I love will be lost. But, but you know, in Arcadia, Septimus says nothing's ever lost. You know, we just have to find it again. And doesn't he also say something like, and also all we actually have is that journey. That's right. 
There's nothing He's, outside of that journey that we keep. There's a wonderful one. I have it somewhere. He says, oh, this is an in, um, invention of love. He says, have you ever seen a cornfield after the reaping laid fat, flat to stubble and here and there unaccountably miraculously spared a few stalks still upright? Why those? There's no reason. Ovid's Medea, the Thyestes of Various, the lost Aeschylus trilogy of the Trojan War gathered to oblivion in sheaves. This is what it is. We keep some things and the rest are lost and yes. we just do imagine we've been losing it all along mm -hmm. and i think because my training I, I wanted to be an archaeologist when i was young these plays for me particularly starboard is like archaeology and you always find clues that come back mm -hmm. well uh, this has been fantastic i've loved talking to you it's so good to see you again and i want to thank everyone who uh joined us tonight um this has been me michael shalon talking to carrie perloff and peter you magically reappeared Michael, um, thank you. You're so amazing. That was fun. Oh, thank you. I loved it. That has been such great fun and so stimulating. I mean, such a wide ranging talk and, and also really just such great storytelling. I mean, the insights, I really ever grateful to you both for this gift uh, and your generosity. I'm going to give City Lights the last word because it's the greatest ever. It saved me during COVID. Elaine Katzenberg, wherever you are, you're my heroine. And you, Peter, and the whole staff of City Lights and the readers and buyers who kept books coming. They're amazing right now. Um, uh, Ukrainian, if you want to support Ukrainian writers, I found some great new novels just yesterday when I went to sign books. And I did sign a bunch of books. So if you go by City Lights, buy all of Michael's and uh, buy my book. And this is my latest favorite of Michael's, Moon Glow, which is uh, so beautiful and feels like a stopper to me. So I'm so honored to have been here. I thank you both. Same. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye.